This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Rook. At the time of this writing, we here at the Word of the Week bunker have just completed the first of the major holiday activities of the holiday season. No doubt you, oh faithful and diligent listener, are well aware of that, given the nature of our most recent episodes. And while we have yet to receive any packages containing multi-layered desserts from any of you, we're confident it's just a matter of time. After all, you're probably still recovering from a slight overindulgence in a very large bird. Speaking of very large birds, (laughs) you'll no doubt recall we mentioned a few weeks ago that we had gone to the well of listener requests from our Patreon supporters in order to get a few more suggested words with which to populate our growing lexicon of gaming-related nomenclature. At the time, we were vaguely dismissive of some of the suggestions made and felt that the effort expended suggesting them was below par and perhaps even poorly thought out. Well, we were foolish. We spoke in haste. We ourselves failed to spend enough effort appreciating the potential of some of the words offered. And more importantly, we're up against the deadline again and out of ideas. So let's take a suggestion from kind listener and friend of the show, Procellus, the Dapper Metroid. They suggested, no less than three times on three separate occasions, that we talk about the rock. And since that meets the medical definition of perseveration, we'll oblige before it gets even more out of hand. The rock is a bird of enormous size that features first in Middle Eastern mythology, Or is that Indian mythology? Because, as with all such things, precise dates and locations are near impossible to pin down. Depending on your sources and on who is doing the dating and research, the story of the Rook dates anywhere from 39 BCE in India to the 8th to 14th century and the collection of Arabian folk tales known as 1001 Nights, except also Marco Polo talked about it in the 13th century and thought they were from Madagascar. But also maybe the stories come from the China Seas and is really about a hovering mountain that was really a rook, and boy, is it nearly impossible to sort it all out. If we had to sort it out, and thankfully we do not, we'd probably give it to the earliest references, even though they don't mention the Rook by name. Well, not by Rook, at least. Let us explain. No, let us sum up. In the end, we have to fall back to the two famous Sanskrit epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Dating from the early 4th century BCE, these two epics provide some of the earliest history of the Hindu faith, and across nearly 225 thousand verses cover wars, exiles, philosophy, and devotional material central to the faith. Within the many lines of the text are references to a giant bird you will have heard about on this show quite recently. And the earliest story of the Rook is essentially a carbon copy of an even earlier story. In our episode on the Hollyfunt, we touched briefly on the subject of Vahana, the animal's various important Hindu deities ride. Among them, the Mount of Lord Vishnu, a giant bird known as Garuda. Garuda is the king of birds, and has both an animal and human-like form. As an animal, he's often described as a kite-like bird with the ability to travel swiftly from place to place. He's a watchful figure and hates serpents. So far, all pretty normal for a species of raptor. Aside from all the god-carrying. According to the various texts, Garuda is also the personification of courage, can shapeshift into any form, and has wings so powerful that the mere flapping of them can stop the spinning of heaven, earth, and hell. All at once. And such a big deal is Garuda that he isn't even limited to just one religion. In Buddhism, Garuda aren't just one being. They're a whole species of creature unto themselves. They're described as having a golden wingspan nearly 4,000 kilometers long. And they are constantly at war with the Naga, a snake-like people who eventually adopt the strategy of swallowing heavy stones to keep from being carried away by the Garuda. We presume a lot of very 
big stones. And then there's a whole thing about a farting bat that interrupts Buddha, which Garuda then kills and for thanks gets exiled from heaven. We've talked about it before. But the story we really want about Garuda, and the one it shares almost directly with the Rook, and so ties the two giant birds together as one concept, is the story of the elephant and the crocodile. One day an elephant went down to the water to drink. Full grown, they say, very large, very heavy. When it dipped its very large trunk into the water to take a very large drink, it was grabbed by a very large crocodile that attempted to pull it into the water. The two creatures struggled against each other, thrashing about in the mud and water among the reeds, trumpeting and hissing and otherwise acting exactly as two animals involved in a life or death struggle. Neither one was making any headway, and their tug-of-war had reached a stalemate when the entire matter was settled by a garuda swooping down at great speed, snatching the elephant in its talons, and flying away with it. There's no report about how the crocodile felt about the whole thing. We assume it pretended to be quite sad for a time, but was really quite relieved. Well, that story got spread around and became, thanks in part to Marco Polo, the 13th century traveler merchant, associated with various Persian and Arabian tales of a giant bird we now know as the Rook, though the original name was closer to Rook in Persian and Arabic. By the way, that's also where we get the word Rook, meaning the chess piece, but not Rook, meaning the type of bird, which was named for the sound of its call. Those Arabian folk tales as collected in 1001 Arabian Nights, tell, in part, the story of Sinbad the Sailor. Presented as a cycle of seven voyages, they appear to be additions to the original collection made somewhere between the 14th and 17th centuries. In the cycle, Sinbad the Sailor lives in the city of Baghdad and finds at his gate one morning a man also named Sinbad, the porter. The porter is complaining bitterly about his lot in life, about how he works hard and has little money, while the rich, of which Sinbad the sailor is clearly one, live a life of leisure. The sailor brings the porter in and explains that his wealth comes merely by good fortune, though upon reading the stories, one would be forgiven for thinking that good fortune was not a particular hallmark of Sinbad the sailor's adventures, except as it pertains to the acquisition of other people's money. Sinbad the S then proceeds to tell Sinbad the P all about his seven adventures at sea. Each tale begins with Sinbad setting out from port in a perfectly good ship with a perfectly good crew, which he then proceeds to lose almost immediately. Curiously, Sinbad has not one but two encounters with the legendary Rook through the course of the tales. On his second voyage, Having miraculously survived his first voyage and returned safely home quite a bit wealthier, he gets bored sitting around the house and decides to set off again. Once again forgotten and left behind by his shipmates, he finds himself ashore on an island which just happens to have a large number of what turn out to be rook eggs. The huge eggs allow him to sneakily attach himself to an incoming rook and hitch a ride to the island's interior, where he finds himself deposited in a valley full of giant snakes and elephants, because why not? A rook's gotta eat. With the echoes of Garuda firmly established, Sinbad notices that the valley floor, in addition to all the wildlife, is also covered with diamonds, because also why not? A Sinbad's gotta feed himself eventually too. While contemplating all this, a giant slab of meat lands in the valley floor, it seems the local merchants cast the meat into the valley, where, upon landing, diamonds embed themselves into the flesh, which is then picked up by the rocks and carried to their nest. Cleverly sussing this all out, Sinbad hides himself under a slab of meat. A rook picks it up and flies meat and Sinbad to its nest, where it is promptly chased off the nest by a squad of presumably extremely brave merchants in order to pick out the collected diamonds. Step 3 profit. Eventually, Sinbad makes his way back to Baghdad and swears off travel forever, having pocketed an extraordinarily large collection of diamonds. Three voyages later, Sinbad has somehow forgotten all the problems and dangers he has gone through in his life to this point. Like, he's just sitting around one day and says to himself, you know, 
Those other four disastrous voyages in which I lost every ship I ever sailed on, saw all the crews perish, saw my friends eaten by Cyclops, had to commit literal murder over and over again just for five scraps of bread on which to survive, and was otherwise in mortal danger every step of the way. Those weren't so bad, let's try again. So off he goes with a new crew and ship and wildly some random passengers because apparently no one had ever heard what happened to him on these voyages. That Sinbad? What could go wrong? He just sails off every few years with a ship and crew, and when he finally returns, he has neither, looks like he's been through hell, and is incredibly rich. I see nothing whatsoever to cause any concern at all. And if that doesn't sound like your game table, we don't know what does. Anyway, before too long, they spot a deserted island with a funny, big, oblong, round thing suspiciously sitting all by itself. And before Sinbad can say, are you really sure that's what you want to do? The passengers and crew put ashore, accidentally crack the egg open, and eat the presumably half-developed rook chick inside. We've had some really bad airline meals, but we were always given to understand that the fare was better on a cruise ship. It boggles the mind to think about how desperate you have to be for something besides a foil packet of six peanuts and a quarter can of flat soda before a giant raw oozing immature bird becomes the meal of choice. And still, everyone except Sinbad manages to act surprised when two adult rooks show up, chase down the fleeing boat and crew, and then sink the whole kit and caboodle by dropping giant stones on it from above. Sinbad the sailor survives, gets even richer, and goes back home to Baghdad. We're never told what Sinbad the porter thinks of all this. Presumably he learns his lesson and spends the remainder of his life in poverty, but with nothing worse than the occasional stubbed toe. Actually, there's a third time Sinbad the sailor is associated with a rook. Two sailors, in fact. In 1936. But first, let's stop by 1919 and visit a man named Elsie Chrysler Seagar. E.C. Seagar, as he was known to fans, had just created a new comic strip, his third, for the newspapers and King Features called Thimble Theater. It starred various characters in what was mostly a gag -a day strip. A gag -a day strip is pretty much what you get in the newspapers these days. It features one joke told each day over the course of three or four panels. Sundays would often feature a more complicated or lengthy joke, usually in color. Gradually, as Seagar got comfortable in the strip and started to develop regular characters, the strip took on more of an adventure serial format. The main characters, Harold Hamgravy and his girlfriend Olive, would go on adventures often inspired by Olive's brother, Castor, and some scheme he had planned to get rich. The adventures were often fun and exciting and full of jokes and laughs, but for the first ten years, Thimble Theater struggled to attract much of an audience. It only appeared in about half a dozen papers up to 1929. And then, on January 17, 1929, Castor, Olive, and Harold boarded a boat headed to Dice Island, a crooked gambling resort which Castor intended to bankrupt thanks to the luck-giving Wiffle Hen he had just acquired. None of them being sailors, they hired the strangest possible man they could find to captain the ship for them. He was short and scrawny, and his arms were strangely misshapen. His jaw stuck out so far that he almost swallowed his nose. And he had only one eye, the other closed in a perpetual squint. And much to Seagar's surprise, fans loved the character. And so... Popeye the Sailor became a regular feature of the comic strip. Harold Hamgravy was soon forgotten, and Olive Oil became Popeye's one and only. Well, mostly one and only. In the strips, which were soon renamed to Thimble Theater starring Popeye, Olive and Popeye are an on-again, off-again couple whose heads are easily turned for a time. But they always return to each other after extended times apart for a variety of funny and adventurous reasons. Quite the cast of characters develops. There's Popeye's foundling son, Sweet Pea, the constantly as hungry as he is broke J. Wellington Wimpy, a magical creature much like the Wifflehen, but more so in the form of Eugene the Jeep, Poop Deck Pappy, Popeye's long-lost father, who comes back into his life reluctantly and unrepentantly, 
the sea hag, a pirate and witch who regularly terrorized the Seven Seas and Popeye in particular, King Blazo, the most worried and put-upon ruler in the world, and hundreds of others who variously assist or hamper the cast on their adventures. By 1938, the strip ran in over 500 papers and had over 600 items of merchandise available to the public. And Popeye's greatest enemy, Bluto, only ever made one appearance. Which is odd, if you're only familiar with the cartoon version of Popeye. In 1932, King Features signed a deal with Fleischer Studios to bring Popeye to the big screen. A series of theatrical cartoons were made by Fleischer and released through Paramount Pictures. In them, Popeye was often seen in competition with Bluto for the affections of olive oil. Inevitably, things would end in a fight between the two, with Popeye taking it quite literally on the chin for a good portion of the cartoon. Eventually, though, a can of spinach would be produced and Popeye would gobble it down, gain incredible strength, and finally win the fight in some extraordinary manner, winning the heart of olive oil all over again. And let's just say it right here and now, that olive oil was a terrible girlfriend, absolutely terrible. She routinely threw him over for anyone who showed the slightest interest in her. She was more than happy to mock Popeye at every opportunity if she thought it would score her points with whatever version of Bluto was around. And she would often create situations in which Popeye would embarrass himself for the amusement of herself and whomever she was with. What Popeye, or anyone for that matter, saw in her will forever remain a mystery. But we digress. Fleischer Studios was founded in 1921 by brothers Max and Dave Fleischer. It was primarily an animation studio that not only brought Popeye to life, but also Betty Boop and Superman. In fact, it was a Betty Boop cartoon that first brought Popeye to the theaters. And it was Max Fleischer who inextricably linked Popeye with spinach. It only ever featured a few times in the original E.C. Seagar strips. In the Fleischer cartoons, it came up every single time. They did well enough for a time, with Disney being their chief and often only rival, but by 1942, Fleischer Studios was in financial trouble. The brothers were no longer speaking to each other, and Paramount Studios bought them out and renamed the studio to Famous Studios. In all, Fleischer Studios released 109 Popeye cartoons, most of which were black-and-white one-reelers, meaning they took up only one film reel and ran for six to ten minutes. There are only three exceptions to that, one of which interests us in particular. On November 27, 1936, Paramount Pictures released a Fleischer-produced color two-reeler film called Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor. It features Popeye, Olive Oil, Wimpy, and what can only be described as Bluto playing Sinbad. Clocking in at just over 16 and a half minutes, the film was billed as the first Popeye feature. It's an amazing cartoon. There's no two ways about it. It was in Technicolor, so the colors were vibrant and saturated. Dave Fleischer directed it and Max produced, but the real star of the production was the background and filming process. Most animated films were made by stacking a series of plates together at varying distances from the camera lens. Those further away from the camera were background plates and had things like hills, walls, or sometimes just flat colors on them, depending on the budget of the film. On top of the background, other elements of the scene can be placed, and on top of that, the characters themselves are placed on clear sheets. Most of the moving elements of the film all occur on the same layer if a character is going to interact with it, which is why you can often tell what will be moving in a scene by looking for the off-color object in the more inexpensively made productions. What you end up with is a stack of thin sheets or cells, which is then flattened and photographed. As a scene or character changes or moves, these cells are changed to produce a series of photographs that when played back at the proper speed, result in Jerry electrocuting Tom in a cute and humorous fashion. What the Fleischers did that was so remarkable was to invent something called a stereoptical process or setback camera. In this process, used throughout much of Popeye meets Sinbad, the background cells are replaced by actual models of the set and scenery. 
Essentially, the camera is photographing through a frame that holds the character cells, like it was a window with a complete model of the scene, say the inside of a cave or a cliffside, sitting on a turntable opposite. As each frame of character action is photographed, the turntable holding the scenery is turned slightly, and thus the figures appear to move through a three-dimensional space. At the time, this put them ahead of everyone else and made Popeye the Sailor meet Sinbad the Sailor look amazing. In the film, Sinbad is a bad guy. No one knows why, he just is. You can tell because not only is he played by Bluto, he opens with a song about how amazing he is as he strolls around his island home, apparently located on the back of a whale, intimidating the various snakes, dragons, gorillas, lions, two-headed men, and giant birds located there. It's a tour de force song about toughness and being extraordinary. So you can only imagine how upset Sinbad is when, just as he is about to launch into the fourth verse, he is interrupted by Popeye singing his theme song, far out to sea in a sailboat, while olive oil flaps in the breeze and Wimpy attempts to cook hamburgers. Sinbad, looking through his spyglass, sees Popeye and crew, and his eye is, naturally, drawn towards the spaghetti-like form of Miss Olive Oil. He conceives an immediate desire for her, and turns to the aforementioned giant bird to order the destruction of the ship and the capture of the girl. So giant is the bird, obviously a rook, that it requires a three-hop running start over flat and level ground in order to get airborne, and sounds very much like a large aircraft as it flies. Eventually it arrives at the ship and circles it a few times, before sharply dipping its wings and severing it in two, causing Popeye and Wimpy to go down with the ship as the rook grabs olive oil and takes it to the island. A little later in the film, because if that was all it took to get rid of Popeye, he wouldn't be so popular, he has another confrontation with the rook. This time, though, Popeye is on firmer ground when Sinbad sicks the bird on him. It grabs Popeye and flies off to a distant volcano where, moments later, we see a cloud of smoke suddenly rise up as if the volcano had gone off. There's a whiz and a boom and a sizzle as Popeye returns from the volcano with the carcass of the rock held overhead on a platter, like a Thanksgiving Day turkey. With gravy, he says. It's a really good cartoon. We like it a lot. Ray Harryhausen cites it as an influence on his film The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. It was nominated for an Academy Award. The United States Library of Congress even declared it a culturally significant film and selected it for preservation in the National Film Registry. It's even in the public domain. So why not go ahead and look up a copy and watch it for yourself? Meanwhile, thanks to Proselys the Dapper Metroid for persevering and making sure we got to their most favoritist critter ever. You can relax now, buddy. And if you are one of our faithful listeners with a suggestion you'd just love to make, head over to Patreon and join up for access to the Discord server. Links in the description. See you there. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. 